Hey everybody, David Burns with you again, and you've probably heard about oxalic acid being used on the extended release pads or sponges as a way to control the viral destructor. And uh, a little over a week ago, the EPA issued a change of decision that is an unacceptable use of the EPA registration uh, of that use of OA on those extended release pads. And uh, there were already a handful of states that had made this extended release uh, acceptable in their states. But the EPA came back and said, uh, no, not now, uh, so you can't use those. I know somebody right in the center of this information that I want to bring in today. And I'm going to bring in Emily Wine, state apiarist of Delaware. Hi, Emily. Hi, David. Thanks for joining me today because uh, you you kind of wound up uh, just asking the EPA a question and then uh, the EPA, well, tell us what happened. Um, so basically from the beginning, um, Delaware was one of the first states to approve the use of extended um, use oxalic acid, which mm -hmm. is oxalic acid applied in glycerin. And um, we were following suit. So New York and Vermont had already approved it. Mm -hmm. And um, our process for approving it in Delaware was that um, I brought it to the attention of our pesticide administrator um, and he looked at it and uh, then, then we elevated it to our regional EPA region three representatives, uh, cause that's the, the region we're in and they didn't have any problems with it. Um, and so they approved it regionally. And so what's happened recently is that, uh, national EPA had reservations about the application method. And so they rescinded the um the uh, method that had been approved regionally yeah and i i got noticed that several states i don't know if they all have but i saw some notices from several of the states that sent out notices to their beekeepers saying you know hey if you're using the extended release uh, you need to take those off the hive because it's no longer um allowed by the epa so i want to ask you a few questions by the way i guess we you and i first met each other a few years ago at an EAS conference in Kentucky. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. I think we had supper with a bunch of other beekeepers one night after a conference. So it's good to see you again. Of course, Randy Oliver was kind of the spearhead on, from his website on the extended release pads and everybody sort of uh, monitored, you know, the way he was describing it on his website. And a lot of people got excited about uh, some of the results that he was showing and a lot of beekeepers began seeing some good results and wanting to try this by uh, combining OA with the uh, glycerin and then using it on some sort of a pad or a sponge and then putting that in the hive. And um, it's, uh, it, I have heard some people say that it works so wonderful for them and other people told me that it didn't work at all. And I, I, some people have told me some universities have done some studies where it didn't have the best of results when they tried it. And uh, that was, some people said, well, that's just the climate, you know. So it seems like it has a, a different uh, effectiveness. And I don't know if that is the way it's being administered or if it's just kind of a geographic thing or not. But um, how do you feel about, um, you know, ha your state having used it for a while, do you feel like it did have good efficacy when it was being used? Well, so we actually have not used it for a while because we approved it in December and then it was just uh, a few, two weeks ago that it was taken off the table. Oh. And um, in it was still pretty cold in mm -hmm. uh, mid-March in Delaware, and I don't know of anyone who actually used it in that December to March window when it was actually allowed. There are a lot of beekeepers that use it, <laughs> and not in just in those few states. There are people using this. If you watch YouTube, you can see people using this all across the country. 
And it is amazing that uh, people have sometimes little regard toward uh, following the label. Um, you know, I'm wondering about the EPA. Do you, do you think that the EPA is aware that beekeepers are using it this way all across the country and don't really care about the label? Um, I think the EPA has some awareness that beekeepers in general have a tendency to be, you know, think it's the Wild West with regards to mm -hmm. using chemicals in their hives. Um, I've definitely spoken to our EPA Region 3 reps about the issue to try to make them more aware of it. Um, and so I think the answer is yes, that they're aware to some degree. Um, as far as like actual enforcement, most of that um, enforcement of pesticide violations comes from the state level with our pesticides division. So say I'm doing an inspection, if I see a pesticide violation, I, I could report it to our state uh, pesticide administrator and um, there that could be um, followed up as a, 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 as a pesticide violation. Mm. Um, we haven't elevated something to that level um, very many times. We did have some like really egregious things happen where like a beekeeper was putting rat poison in his hives, which is mm -hmm. just an insane thing for wow. anyone yeah. to do. Yeah. Um, so like it, it is, we do have the power in the States to, mm -hmm. um, to pursue uh, misuse of, of pesticides. I see. And what about, uh, how do you feel that's may come down, you know, because we're talking about, if I understand this right, is this this uh, unacceptable use of OA, the the letter that you received, was it was it from a federal EPA or a state? And my question is, you know, because the federal EPA may make a decision, the the local state EPA can they make a decision different so, than what the federal may make? So. All EPA is a federal agency, mm. but um, there are regional divisions of the federal agency. So uh, the feds are always above the state government, which is what I'm in. So um, our, our regional EPA is the federal agency directly overseeing our region. And then the national EPA is above the regional EPA. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So you, you just have to do what the EPA says, right? <laughs> yeah. It's interesting to me when I was reading the letter that you received from them, there was a section in there where they had uh, listed, I don't know, a handful of concerns that they had about using OA in the extended pads. And one of them was that in this application, they were concerned that some of the matrices or the, the uh, pads or the sponges or whatever, they, they may have had fire retardant uh, parts to them or as part of that release, the sponge itself or the material may have had fire retardant on it, which they said could be harmful to bees. And um, that was interesting to, for me to think. I never thought about that part of it before. It could be harmful to bees. I think the, the even bigger concern is that fire retardants are harmful to human health and that it could wind up in the honey. Oh, I um, see. Yeah. So uh, it's a carcinogen and it's a uh, mm. dangerous mm. Uh, chemical to um, have getting in contact with food. Um, I will add that like, it, Randy Oliver was doing due diligence in his studies with, in terms of safety, he was using um, Swedish dishcloths, which because they're dishcloths, they're designed to be used in, in kitchens and in close proximity to food. Um, so those an original cellulose pads used in his studies would likely have been safe. Um, but 
there are a lot of other cellulose pads on the market that are used for um, like industrial spill cleanups and are in spill kits and those contain fire retardants, um, mm. which are definitely dangerous chemicals to have in in a beehive. Oh, I see. So a uh, beekeeper could actually use those and uh, actually somehow release that chemical that might even contaminate the honey on board. So yeah, the fire retardants, they're PFOS chemicals, which are considered forever chemicals. So they're yeah. chemicals that are just extremely persistent in the landscape and will stick around for a really long time and build up in, in human tissues as well. Mm. Um, so it's something that the EPA is currently really trying to limit the amount oh, of fire yeah. retardants in things. And so, um, again, it is possible to purchase cellulose pads without fire retardants. It's just the um, initial 2EE recommendations that came out were pretty vague about what a cellulose pad is and oh, yeah. how, to, yeah. how to select one that's safe. Can can beekeepers be unaware of this, and could they be using um, pads that are that possibly could have fire retardant in them? How how do beekeepers make that call? I mean, again, this is not something that beekeepers are allowed to be mixing up right. on their own now. So I'm, I'm not going to really comment about. <laughs> yeah. Fire, well. Um, okay. Well. <laughs> I know. I, I totally agree with you on that because uh, I, I am one that feels very strongly that we should always follow the label. And that's always something that I tell my viewers that never would I recommend you follow anything outside the label. The reality is that beekeepers don't always follow the label, which is really unfortunate. And I'm sure that some beekeepers, some people in general just don't like being told what to do, especially by the government. And they're going to do what they have to do to keep their bees alive. And they don't really care. They don't feel like it's going to be enforced. But I think that's sad because, um, you know, I, I can't remember which which treatment we used to have years ago. But because of its misuse or it wasn't handled correctly, we did lose it. It was taken away from us as beekeepers. So we can always have some repercussions that we don't want to deal with. So following the label is always a good idea for sure. It's the law. Yeah, so following the label, it's important for exactly the reason you mentioned, which is that it will help keep products useful over time and keep mites from developing resistance. It also keeps your bees safe because the you, it, it ensures that the, the concentrations of the pesticides are not so high that they're going to harm the bees because the biology of a bee is not that different from the biology of a mite. So right. it's something that is a miticide, you have to be really careful on bees just because mites and insects are just very similar biologically. And then the next level of protection that comes from the EPA's registration process is safety to humans and making sure that you're not exposed exposing humans to dangerous levels of chemicals through the honey. Yeah, those are good points. I'm glad you mentioned that. I think sometimes beekeepers may just be thinking about how do I kill a, a mite and they don't realize all the other ramifications, how it can affect so many different things. So I'm, I'm glad you brought those points up. Um, you know, uh, getting back to the extended release on the pads or the sponges, uh, now being illegal to use anywhere in any state. Now, we need to clarify that because every time I mention that, that we can't use OA in that way, someone would come back and say, oh, there's several states that are approved though. And not anymore. It's across the board. You, we can't use uh, OA in extended pads. In your state, do you find particular treatments that are very effective that beekeepers are using? Are they sticking to one that seems to be effective? You know, are they finding Apivar, Apigard working well, or osolic acid uh, vaporization working well? Are they using all of those? How, how does that, how is that working out in Delaware? Um, I think we definitely are seeing a little bit of overuse of Apivar. Um, I did do some sampling for Frank Rinkovich, looking to see if we're 
having amitraz resistance, which is the active ingredient in apivar developing in Delaware. And uh, we got kind of borderline results where um, he, Frank said that um, the resistance levels were such that it was, he wasn't sure if there would be a failure if those operations used April oh. the next year. They weren't so resistant that the operation needed to totally stop using it, but yeah. they were resistant enough that there was a chance of 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 failure um, in the oh, coming right. year. And that was just a uh, really just tests on one specific operation that I know that operation really just only uses APIVAR. Um, they're yeah. pretty pretty much there, so there's a high likelihood of um, resistance developing. Yeah. And so the the recommendation is always going to be ro to rotate between treatments and not to rely on one specific. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. I, I think sometimes we might find something that works really well and think, well, I'll just stick with that because it worked well, not realizing that rotating in and out of different treatments are going to be better. So you're uh, you're kind of like the bee inspector, um, single-handed bee inspector in Delaware then, aren't you? Not quite single-handed. It's a really small program where the apiary program in Delaware is me and then I hire one seasonal inspector. Yeah. So okay. I am I am out there doing the inspections. I'm not yeah. just overseeing yeah. things from the office. That's, that's, that's good. Well, I'm glad you're doing that. Um, are you seeing a lot more hobbyists when you make your inspections? Do you, do you see a lot of people getting into beekeeping for the first time? Uh, well, Delaware is such a, a unique state in that there's really no large commercial beekeepers oh. here. There's quite a few that come in for pollination from mm -hmm. other states, like from New Jersey and from Maryland. We've got some sideliner sized businesses mm -hmm. with the say 50 to 300 scale uh, colonies that um, stay that are based in Delaware. But in terms of um, larger operations that are based in in delaware there really aren't any okay. so it's mostly hobbyists and sideliners here nice well that's probably fun for you and your team to go out and help new beginners and answer some of the questions they're dealing with and help them out that's yeah nice. it's it's a lot of uh working with hobbyists and i do actually have the opportunity to do open hive events and do some oh. hands-on workshops for beekeepers oh, here good. as well. Good. Yep. Well, do you run into people new to beekeeping that just don't want to use any treatments for their mites? They don't, you know, they, I, I find that people are oftentimes saying, you know, I, I'm eating honey out of my hive. I don't feel good about putting these chemicals in there. And they're looking for different integrated pest management approaches that don't include uh, the use of chemical treatment. Do you find that to be true too? All the time. I, I run into people who don't want to treat their bees all yeah. the time. And there are very viable ways to be treating I agree. beekeepers. Um, and it, it, it just involves a lot of labor. And yeah. it's also a, I think it's a, a level up in beekeeping. Like it's a, it's, it take it's challenging. It's not an easy thing for a brand new beekeeper to go straight into being able to be treatment free. Um, well, and, that's, yeah, that's right. And so I, I think that um, it's it's an advanced skill to be a tr treatment free beekeeper. And I think hobbyists that try to do that right from the beginning often wind up um, really disappointing themselves and not staying in beekeeping. Oh, yeah, that's I, I really like that you said that because uh, for many years uh, I practiced for the most part not having to use treatments, uh, chemical treatments. But there are times that I have to, you know, if I'm looking at my mic counts and I can't keep it under control. But I do constantly evaluate it. And, you know, I try to use things like a green drone comb. I try to break the queen's brood cycle three times uh, when mites are, you know, July, August, September, uh, to put a pause in the brood cycle. Um, I'll use screen bottom boards, powdered sugar dusting. There's a lot of things that I try to have and then have 
queens themselves that have showed some resistance to mites reproducing. But there are times that that you're right. That is a skill. You you know that's all that I do. So I'm able to spend a lot of time out there doing that. But a new beekeeper trying to implement that, quite not understanding bees yet, that could be challenging. I can see that for sure. And in general, I find that the people who are successful as treatment-free beekeepers tend to be nuke producers because they make so many splits and break the brood cycle so frequently. And mm. nuke producers will very successfully be treatment-free and then uh, sell to beekeepers who want to manage large, large production hives and make honey and then there's just a gap where it, those, those, those same bees that were doing well for the nuke producer wind up not doing well for as treatment free for the person who wants to make honey. Yeah. Yeah. Good points. I like, I like that a lot. That's really good. Oh, well, good. Uh, so in the, I guess the last question I want to ask Emily, what about the foreseeable future? Do you think, uh, are you optimistic that the EPA may even make a change on you know, how many grams we can we use in the vaporization of OA? And you think they'll ever revisit the extended pads? Is that in the work? What do you think? So as far as label changes with the EPA, the normal process is that it would be initiated by the registrant. So that would be the manufacturer of the product who registered it um, in the United States. And they, their product products are also registered in each individual state. Um, and so typically if there's going to be a label change, the registrant would approach the EPA about initiating that and ask if there's additional testing that needs to be done. And if they have data, then from their own studies, they would supply that to the EPA. Um, and then there's also a process where, um, products are reviewed every five years as well, um, hmm. which doesn't have to be initiated by the registrant. That's just a normal um, re review cycle. Um, so in in terms of sort of like a grassroots um, change to the label, I, I don't know if that can happen or how, because mm -hmm. this is something that has not been led by the company. Um, but it definitely, if it's something that you, that viewers wanted to see happen, they could uh, reach out to the manufacturer of the product and say that they're interested yeah. in seeing the label change. My understanding is it's a long process. I was talking with uh, um, Cameron Jack and um, spoke with him in Nevada a little bit ago, and he was telling me that you know plans are in the work to change how the vaporization, how hopefully to increase that to to maybe two grams a deep, but he, he felt like that that's, that's going to be a while. It probably won't be as long as an initial product approval, because the thing that takes the longest is to approve a new active ingredient. Mm -hmm. And if the oxalic acid itself has now been approved for use on bees. So, mm -hmm. um, changing something about the method of application is a faster process than a, a whole new active ingredient, yeah. but it's still, I don't know exactly how long it would take. Yeah. And in terms of the extended release, um, one of the issues the EPA had with it is that it introduced some inert ingredients as well as the active ingredient, and those inert ingredients would need to be studied. So that's the glycerin and potentially looking at if that winds up in the honey, um, although it is food safe, um, but they may be interested still to see how much yeah. winds up in the honey. And um, again, they were concerned about issues with the cellulose pads. Um, and also there's, I think separate studies are conducted when something's going to be a short-term exposure versus a long-term exposure. And so the fact that it's extended release, I think, will will trigger some additional studies of 
um, looking at long term exposure to the active ingredient. Yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah. So hopefully uh, beekeepers will realize that uh, the extended pad, the extended release of OA is a no, no, no matter what state you live in. Well, I'll keep hearing that forever that it's been approved in uh, Delaware and it hasn't. <laughs> it was. <laughs> it was, but now it's not. That's right. Yeah. yeah, that's good. So um, what's the weather like? What's the bees doing in Delaware now? The bees are swarming already. It's, oh no, it's are they super, really? Super, super early. Um, yeah, it, it's at least a month early. Oh my gosh. Oh wow. So that's probably caught beekeepers off guard, didn't it? Yeah, it's been there. We really didn't have a winter here. It's been crazy warm. It, it, we didn't even get any snow that stuck to the ground, really. We usually get at least a couple decent snowstorms. Yep. My problem here in Illinois is that we had a really good, we had a kind of a mild winter, but then uh, it warmed up a lot and bees were flying and looking for everything to eat a month ago. And, you know, all at once they were raising drones and looking good and it's like way too early and then all at once we had a cold snap and the bees haven't been been able to fly now for probably a good three to four weeks and it i can't go in there and inspect it's too cold to go inspect for queen cells so it's we're gonna have to really hustle when the weather finally gets warm enough to go in there and start doing swarm control kind of late in the game that's going to be tough this year yeah i mean and especially if you got that cold snap when the population's really big and there's lots of brood to feed and they're stuck in yeah. their lives definitely yeah. starvation could be a concern yep. I've, been, I've been worried about that as well <laughs> yeah it was like i was hoping it was just going to stay nice we're going to you know have time to just breathe into spring and but no it didn't work out that way and, well emily it's good to see you again and i really appreciate you coming on and letting us kind of unwind this what it was all about you did clear up a lot of things that uh, made a lot of sense to us so really appreciate it anything else you want to say about the uh epa ruling um i guess like the overall message is always that these epa rules yes it seems like the epa moves slowly because they do move slowly but it they do have the safety of our bees at heart they have they're looking at human safety and they're looking at limiting resistance to miticides and so they are protecting us and it is important to always follow the label yeah yeah very good advice all right emily uh thanks again for joining us i'll let you go and uh we'll hopefully see you again you're going to be at eas in the future uh, I'm not sure about this year, but I'm definitely going to be at EAS in the future. I think this year I'm going to go to the the International Bee Conference at, at Penn State instead. Do you know that yeah, one? I That's see. a really great conference. Yeah. All right. All right. I'll talk to you later, Emily. All right. See ya. See ya. Thanks again.